Capernaum was one of those towns which was mi a mixture of Gentiles and Jews. And the Pharisees gave the impression to the Jews and they were uh, they had they added to all of God's laws they added 630 precepts and you you had to wash your hands seven times before you ate you had to do all these crazy rituals before blowing your nose <coughs> before doing anything and uh, it was very burdensome on the people and when it came to money and uh, widows inheritance and so forth the, 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 the corrupted chief priests uh, used these, these 630 precepts <coughs> as means to fill their own pockets. So it was a, there was a great corruption um, in the Old Testament leaders, and this was the true religion. So our Lord came to make war against the powers of hell, throw out the prince of darkness. And when when they saw our Lord, a Jew, speaking and working miracles for the non-Jews, the Jews were furious. And they were offended that any, any Jew was not supposed to talk to a non-Jew, because the, the non-Jews were all the, the, the goyim, as they still call them. Uh, the goyim are the cattle, the, use, the, the thinking list, the thoughtless cattle who just follows the crowd and they still they still hold that they still hold this position and you can really you should all of you especially you men you need to read uh, the synagogue rising by Hugh Akins who exposes all this and uh, it's not just you know these uh, freaky conspiracy theories it's it's really built solidly on the papal encyclicals and the popes have been shouting about this for the past 300 400 years and <clears throat> Hugh Akins in this book really pulls it together. <clears throat> and even an honest Jew himself wrote to Hugh Akins and said, this book is right. These, there are rotten Jews who really seek to undermine everything. So a Jew had be, even admitted that, although himself wasn't Catholic, but pray for him. So the Jews w were not supposed to talk to the Gentiles. And they see our Lord freely speaking to them. After he first preached to the Jews, he would freely speak to the Gentiles. And the woman at the well, the woman with the hemorrhage, and here the centurion. And the, 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 our Lord cures his son miraculously. So the Jews, how did they perceive our Lord? They perceived him in the Old Testament prophecies. They all expected the Messiah, but they expected him to come in a materialistic political power sense. They expected him to be the one who would raise the armies and go conquer Rome, and the Jews would be the top dogs on the earth. And when they saw our Lord was so different than what they had expected, that he was actually poor, he had no place to lay his head, that he spoke with everyone, cured the sick, and spoke to the, even spoke to children, and cured so many that the Jews couldn't figure it out. And then of course, in his sacred passion, to be humiliated and crucified, they just couldn't believe it. But there were, the Old Testament prophecies were all there in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and uh, St. David, the Psalms, and uh, even, even in the book of Genesis, the, the types are all there, and the antitypes foreshowing Christ coming in humility, that he would ride on a donkey into Jerusalem, that he would be humiliated and crushed and crucified and rejected by his own. And we are living in very similar times now when Christ is being rejected at every single level. And what's, what hurts us most, what hurts the Sacred Heart of Jesus most, as he told St. Margaret Mary of Alucoc, what hurts me most is the sins of those consecrated to me, the nuns, 
the monks, the priests, and the bishops. And it's these who should be the first defenders of our Lord. They should be the first to rally around his sacred heart and defend his honor and his name. And as we've seen in the last 50 years since Vatican Council II, and even 100 years ago, with modernism infiltrating the Catholic Church already, who has been the first to betray our Lord? It's, it's always been his closest friends. And maybe some of you have experienced something like that, betrayals from good friends, backstabbing and so forth. But our Lord went through it, and he's still going through it. By his own, now, these last five popes, stabbing our Lord right in the back, continually. And the bishops who are spineless and who have no... They're not even worth to be called men, let alone bishops. And they betray our Lord, every one of them. And the only one that we know of that's actually speaking openly, defending more than any the honor of Christ is uh, Bishop Williamson. God bless him and pray for him. But all are cowering, are cowering. And it's a grave, grave <clears throat> offense to Almighty God and you got to, what, what draws us here in, in a hotel room here in Connecticut, why, why are we doing this? And why am I coming here and flying all over the country and another, other priests throughout the world of the resistance who are trying to take care of souls in this crisis? What is this all about? Is it a political, an argument over documents? How to interpret certain documents? Is it an argument about personalities? Well, I'm, I'm with this bishop and I'm against this bishop. No, it's not. Is it an argument about, uh, you know, church politics? And we're just taking sides? Do we belong to some club? No, we don't. We are Roman Catholic. We hold the faith that Christ established, that, that came from the Blessed Trinity. The second person took on the flesh. And he came as a warrior omnipotens vir calls him in the Psalms, the, the strong man who comes to make war against the devil. And the devil holds all of us under his slavery if we, are, if we give ourselves to him by sin. And all of us, of course, were born chained up in his chains of slavery, of sin. And Christ's blood breaks those chains in, in the sacrament of baptism. And in confession, if a soul falls into the devil's traps again, and again, and again, and again, our Lord washes and breaks those chains with his precious blood. So he is the victor. He is the conqueror. But his ways are not man's ways. <clears throat> and his wisdom is foolishness to man. And what is wise to man and smart and scientific is foolishness to God. And whatever is true is from God. And when science respects truth, it's respecting what God put in. But when science goes off on its, on its crazy aberration, such as evolution, uh, and forces us down generations of kids in school, shoves it down their throat, that your great-great-grandma was a chimpanzee and an, a a and an ape and the world. Do you know who invented the Big Bang Theory? I never knew this until two weeks ago. There was a Catholic priest in France who invented the Big Bang Theory. A priest. And the Padre Teilhard de Chardin who praised evolution. It's always the, the ones closest to our Lord who betray him the most. It started with Judas and it's, it continues to the end of the world. So again, what, what is this whole fight for the faith about? Vatican II, and now Bishop Follet's betrayals and his compromises, and it's, it's hard to believe, it's hard for me to believe, because I've always respected him and I still always pray for him, but it's very, very sad what's, what's happening. But why? What's at the heart of the fight? At the heart of it is our Lord Jesus Christ is God, and that's final. Oh. Well, where do you have proofs for that? Well, who alone had a virgin birth? Who alone rose himself from the dead? 
who alone ascended into heaven by his physical power. And he was not assumed, which is passive like the Virgin Mary. She was assumed into heaven, carried by angels. The Christ was not assumed. He ascended. He acted because he is God. And we see in the sacred scriptures his dominance. Firstly, he created all things. Through him all things were made. And his dominance over inanimate objects. It was the baby Jesus, the living God in the cradle at Bethlehem in the manger. It's he that led the, the magi by the star. He moved the star. It was he that ordered the angels, go sing to the shepherds and tell them. So it was Christ who had power over inanimate objects. At his passion and death, what happened? A three-hour eclipse of the sun, never, never recorded in history, but it's recorded. It was seen by pagans in, in, in Spain and even in northern Egypt, and it's recorded. And also the tremendous earthquake at his death, and the tremendous earthquake at his resurrection, and the veil in the temple ripping in half from top to bottom. And you ladies know what it's like cutting a thick material with a pair of good scissors. It's not so easy. So to rip a, a, a 60 foot high, a, sick, a, a very thick, heavy material hanging, blocking, which, which marked the, the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, that was ripped from top to bottom. And then Christ cursed the fig tree, if you remember in the, in the gospel. He cursed this big, green, healthy looking tree, but it bore no fruits. And the apostles saw him curse it, and then they went on their way to the town of Jerusalem, and on their way back, they saw the tree completely dried up and withered and dry and dead, the one that Christ cursed. So Christ had power over inanimate objects. And then he had power over the animal kingdom. Peter says to our Lord, Lord, how are we going to pay the tax? We have no more money. Judas, Judas gave it all away, so he thought. And our Lord said, Peter, take your, take your hook and, and line and draw a fish out of the lake. And then you'll, you'll find a stator and pay the tax with that. So St. Peter, who had seen miracles of our Lord already many times, he didn't doubt. And he went, drew the fish, pulled in the fish, and there it was, a state or a coin in his mouth, and he paid the coin with that. He paid the taxes with that. Our Lord also, uh, as you know, has recorded many times the miraculous catch of fish, his dominance over the animal kingdom. And... What about over man? His dominance over men, men's sicknesses. And today in the gospel he cures this leper. Our Lord receives from the leper adoration. If our Lord was a truthful prophet, he would not say, don't adore me. He, he, would, he would not say, don't, he would not say, don't adore me. He would say, do adore God. But he receives adoration because he is God. And who alone can, can say your sins are forgiven? Sins offend God, so only God can forgive what offends him. But Christ said, I forgive you. And only God can say that. And this is, the Jews got furious over this. How can he, being a man, forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. They all understood that. And so, our Lord... Uh, has command over men's sicknesses. He has commands over, over their diseases. He heals them by the thousands. He would enter a town and people would just get, he would empty out the hospitals, empty out the nursing homes. He would go find the lepers and those of good will would be cured. And they were so numerous, the miracles, that it was just, you know, frontline news every day. More cures, more miracles throughout the whole region, and, and it carried throughout all the way to Rome. And uh, according to Father Jacobus Varagine, Rome heard about this 
miracle worker in, in Jer Jerusalem. And then our Lord also had tremendous sway. St. Jerome says our Lord's burned with fire when he overthrew the tables in the temple and he drove them out with whips. And St. Jerome says, and Origen says, this also proves his divinity because one man holding sway over thousands of people. Normally, you know, anybody doing this, the, the soldiers would have jumped him and, you know, you're causing a rocket, you're causing public disturbance. But our Lord, even, even the Roman soldiers, those were the Marine Corps, the Navy SEALs of those days, they didn't even dare approach him because Christ exhibited in his words, in his anger, the strength of Almighty God, and they didn't dare touch him. And that's another proof, says St. Jerome, of the sway he had. And then many times, as you know, they tried to arrest our Lord. They tried to push him over the cliff in Nazareth. They tried to uh, arrest him before his time. And St. Augustine says, when he was surrounded, and it wasn't his hour to be captured, Christ, says St. Augustine, made himself invisible and passed through them. Saint, Saint, so says St. Augustine. So our Lord had had a power over men, but not as, as you know, he, he never showed anger except to the hypocrites. The hypocrites' pride is one sin Christ hates most. But always, even, even the greatest sinners who wallowed in the mud, St. Mary Magdalene and, and many other sinners, the woman caught in adultery, and uh, the men who were dishonest in business, he dealt with them mercifully always mercifully, but it was pride that he hates the most. So our Lord shows his, his dominance, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, summarizes, over inanimate objects, over animals, over men, but also over the angels. And he had power, of course, over the fallen angels, the devils. <coughs> and how many times in the Gospels and the Scriptures is revealed Christ commanding the devil to leave. And the devils at one time, uh, a father brought his son, and the devils were shouting at him, We know who you are. You are the Holy One, the One, the Messiah. <coughs> and by this time, the devils had figured it out, because it had been hidden from them. But all these people witnessing this, and Christ orders him, Be quiet. Christ orders the devils to shut their mouth, and commands them to leave. So he showed before all the, all the chief priests and all the people his dominance over the devils themselves. And when Christ was tempted, he allowed himself. We might be a little surprised. How does our Lord allow himself to be treated this way? With, with continual sacrileges, continual betrayals, continual sacrilegious masses that go on. And Father Malachi Martin and Father Via both expose the satanic rituals that go on right in the Vatican during the Vatican Council. Rituals to Satan within the walls of the church, within the walls of St. Peter's. How does our Lord submit to this? To be desecrated and sacrilegious communions. <coughs> While our Lord himself allowed himself, says St. Gregory, to be carried by the devil up to the pinnacle of the temple and up on the mountain when he was tempted. And then Christ ordered him, Be gone, Satan. So, our Lord had mastery over the devils and he had mastery over the angels as well. The angels that appeared at the resurrection telling the apostles, He's risen. <laughs> Don't look for the dead among the dead. He's not dead. St. Mary Magdalene and the angels that spoke and sang at Bethlehem and the angels that after the 40 day fast of Christ remember it says in the gospel the angels came and ministered to him what's that mean to minister to when the ladies ministered to their guests in a house that means they serve them they feed them and the angels brought you know we don't know the, what the menu was but they brought the best food for our Lord 
to uh, well, most likely simple food for, for his choice, but uh, they brought him food and drink to refresh him after the 40-day fast. So the angels ministered him to him, and also in the agony of the garden, the angel of consolation, holding the chalice, that is, our Lord saw, saw the names of all those who will go to heaven. And hopefully he saw your names there. Your name maybe was there to console him in his agony of the garden. <coughs> and even after offending him, repentance always moves our Lord to mercy. And so it was worth it, our Lord going through the passion to save the, the many who will save their soul. The many compared to the human race. So our Lord had mastery over all the angels, the devils, mankind, over all sickness, diseases, over all animal kingdom, over all the inanimate objects and the planets and the, the sun and everything. So his, just his, everything about our Lord shows he is God and he's king. And how is he king? He's king firstly over hearts. He doesn't, he doesn't chain any of us. But he gave us intelligence and will, and we're supposed to acknowledge the true religion that he established, and it's, it's objective that he founded one church. And, it, and no one doubted this up until the 1500s, that there was one Roman Catholic church. There was no doubt. No one questioned it. There were heresies, but but there was only one church, and there still is only one Catholic church. And then how do you know if you belong to the one church Christ established? By private interpretation of the Bible? No. Because the Bible has many contradictory things, many things difficult to understand, which many interpret to their destruction, as St. Peter says. So our guide is, is the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Catholic Church of tradition. Not this conciliar church, this fabrication built and helped built by the devils. As Blessed Catherine Emmerich saw, she foresaw this fabricated church being built with the help of devils. And this is the church, as Bishop Tissier calls it, it's the sect within the Catholic Church that has, that has hijacked the Catholic Church. And now it's governed by these betrayers. Uh, kind of like Odysseus, his house was taken over by the, all these suitors and all these uh, useless uh, bombs. And it's the same now in the Catholic Church, which has been hijacked. But where is the Catholic Church? It's in, it's in all those who hold the faith of all time. And all those priests and bishops, as few as they are, that hold to the faith of all time. And so... This, how, how are we defending Christ's divinity now? Why? Because Vatican II, very simply, Vatican II attacks Christ as God. It attacks him as king. It attacks his one Catholic Church. It attacks the primacy of Peter. It attacks the hierarchy of the Catholic Church by collegiality. It attacks the very foundations of the faith. Vatican II is poisoned through and through in all its reforms. You know, I don't need to give a big theological dissertation for you to be convinced of the fruits of Vatican II. Just drive down the street. Look at all the empty Catholic churches. Look at all the priests running around in lay clothes. Look at all the nuns with their hair curled and wearing secular blue jeans now uh, to their shame. Look at all the Catholic schools that are now in the hands of the, of the federal government con, uh, conditions for education. All secular, purely secular, evolutionist, atheistic, and impure with their promoting of uh, contraception in the schools and, and, and the education, uh, immoral education. I don't need to give details. And the Catholic bishops. Uh, they're not worth, even worth a sentence. We'll pass on. But look at the state of the Catholic Church. And the devil 
And our Lord and the Virgin Mary foretold these times would come. And who were the faithful ones in the last 50 years? It's those who stood up to defend Christ as God, Christ as King, and His true Mass, and His true sacraments. And all of you, especially you older people, you would remember uh, Father Gomer de Paul. You would remember Father Victor Moroz in Buffalo, who was a son of St. Maximilian Kolbe, spiritual son for 14 years. He was a spiritual director. St. Maximilian Kolbe told him, because he didn't want to be a priest, he wanted to stay a humble brother. And after the third time he refused to be a priest, St. Maximilian Kolbe told him, my son, Brother Victor, if you don't become a priest, you will lose your soul. And St. Maximilian Kolbe foresaw that this priest would be for the United States of another light for tradition. And he kept faithful and gave his chapel to the Society of St. Pius X back in 92 when he died. And now we're in this new phase of the war. And think about it. If the Catholic Church can be infiltr infiltrated and hijacked from the top, if the Diocese of Campos can be after so many years, 20 years after, after the death of its, of his great Bishop de Castro Mayor. And after he died, the priests uh, went along with Vatican II, made the agreement with Rome under Bishop Urfan, and now they're given communion in the hand. Now they have altar girls. These were priests who 25 years ago were totally against this corruption of the church. And how could Campos fall? Well, they fell. They fell. And is the Society of Pius X infallible? Is Bishop Fillet infallible? Only the Pope has the promise of infallibility, and this Pope doesn't believe in it. They don't want to use infallibility. Paul VI did not want to use infallibility with Vatican II. So they fell right prey to the devil. And Bishop Fillet, we got to pray for him. Yes, he's the Superior General, but he... he he is not infallible. And I want to draw your attention. Uh, last week, the French, I was in Quebec City, and the good people there, they dug up the interview from 2001. The famous interview where Bishop Fillet says 95% of Vatican II is acceptable. Well, we're, we're getting, we got that translated in English. We're putting it out this week onto the blogs, wherever. Uh, this coming week, but try to find it. The interview with Bishop Fillet in the year 2001, it is quite surprising. I never knew about it till till last week. It's a short interview, but in that interview, he's got everything planned out. Everything is laid out. He's dealt with Rome, the 2000 year Jubilee uh, pilgrimage, that was planned, and it was also planned for the, the motu proprio on um, supposedly releasing the Tridentine Mass. But th that's a bogus because every priest who says the Tridentine Mass has to accept also the new Mass by the motu proprio of Benedict XVI. They had already prearranged the lifting of the so-called excommunications to get the Catholic traditionalists to believe, hey, an agreement with Rome is good, to get inside the church is good. We can be the leaven in the dough and convert it from within. But the archbishop was not that stupid, to put it very blunt. He wasn't that stupid. He knew you don't put authority, you don't put tradition under the authorities who don't have the faith. They will crush it, as they've done to all the 11 groups of tradition who put themselves under modernist Rome, and now they, they have to accept Vatican II. And they hate it, some of them don't like it, but they're, they're caught in the trap. And Bishop Fillet, in 2001, he already was saying, the Council Vatican II is no problem for us. In fact, we accept 95% of it. And I, I am sure the priests in France who saw this, I'm sure many of them, like like probably I would have done, would have said, well, 2001, way back then, Bishop Fillet, surely he was misquoted. Surely he was, you know, dis dishonest journalists, and you know how they can be. Surely we would have excused this. But now, 
2014, we can see everything he said has happened. And he has, he has not changed one step backwards. He has never done a 180, not once. And what further confirms this new direction is the punishment to the priests and the expelling of Bishop Williamson and so forth. And it continues. It's not turning back. And Father Pfluger in a recent talk giving a retreat to brothers, he said the society needs this purification. Get rid of all these, all these uh, Williamsonites. <laughs> but we're not Williamsonites. We're not the Feverists. We're Roman Catholic. And we all know that if we put ourselves and make any agreement with Vatican II or accept it in any way or the new Mass, we're done. You'll lose your faith. It's that poisonous. So we want to be Roman Catholic. We want to follow our Lord Jesus Christ the true king, the true God. And what's at the heart of the fight is that Vatican II rips the crown off of Christ. It mocks him, it crucifies him by removing the Catholic states, that, that by saying everyone, anyone is free to believe whatever he wants and you can go to heaven in that way. That's false. We don't have the right to believe what we want. We have to believe the truth. It's the truth that makes us free. So... What about, how can you, what, what's the big deal? There's no agreement yet. Ever heard that one? There's no agreement yet. So why are you so uh, worried about all this? And there won't be an agreement under Pope Francis, so why are you so flustered? Well, because what does an agreement bring with Rome? It brings that you have to accept Vatican II and the new Mass, the new Code, the new profession of faith. That's why every Catholic with common sense knows we don't make an agreement with modernist Rome, but we pray for Rome's conversion. We pray for the Pope to get back some Catholic sense. But until then, we don't obey their illegitimate laws of the new Mass and Vatican II. We can't. The Pope has a right to our disobedience, said Archbishop Lefebvre. And so now does Bishop Follet. Why? Because Although there's no public agreement that we know of, he's already swallowed the poison. He accepts Vatican II. He really believes it's interpretable in the light of tradition. And that's completely false. The Archbishop saw and, and knew that. He said the council, we cannot accept. And then the new mass, uh, Bishop Follet and the leaders, they, they say it is legitimate. If you say the new Mass is legitimate, then that's one step from saying it. It's not legitimate. You know what Archbishop Lefebvre called it, <laughs> the Mass Batard in French, which in English properly interpreted is the illegitimate Mass. But Batard, <laughs> that's pretty blunt. And just look at the fruits of the new Mass. It's horrible. It's horrible. So, dear faithful, it is about the few who are left on this earth who truly profess Christ as God and He's King. And that means, that means if you got to stand opposed to the whole world, well, you stand opposed to the whole world. We've got God and all His armies on our side. What's to fear? And let me just close with another example. Um, just two nights ago, we brought the seminarians to hear the talk of Dr. Dr. Paul Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E. He's, he's like an Archbishop Lefebvre in the medical world. He opposes this, this whole new shift since the 70s of desecrating life, treating, treating patients and life like it was just a mani matter of money and money making. He's a true doctor. He's 80 years old. He's, he's the old, good, old, good old-fashioned doctor that really was there to take care and help you get better and support life and help the patients heal and get back on their feet. And he's been fighting for the past, since the 70s, he's been fighting 
What has happened in all the Western world, which is a systematized murder, and it's all under the name of organ donation. And you Catholics in the world, the, the American people got to wake up and realize how insidious this really is. And, and this doesn't go to just 15 to, to 40. This is all ages. And the doctor explained even uh, the, the case of a baby that was still alive. They had him in ice. A little baby in ice preserving him to get his organs for another baby. To, and how do they get a, the organs of the heart? How do they get the liver? How do they get s certain organs that you can't live without? You have to kill the person. And this is t going on hundreds of times a day in our hospitals. And he says the, the, this comfort care that injects the patient with tons of morphine, the morphine inhibits the cough. You can't cough anymore. So the, the pneumonia easily sets in. And they die. It's, it's, it's a systematized euthanasia that is going on. And it's been going on. And uh, they have a new term called brain death. And he says brain death is a, is a total fiction. Because firstly, the brain is very complicated and you can't tell they can only read certain parts of the brain. But there's a lot of the brain they can't judge any reaction from. And brain death is a total fiction. And it's an excuse to take those bodies and take their organs while they're still alive. Their heart is pumping. And he showed us actually a video of when they open the chest of a person, the heart is beating. And they take it. They kill the person organ transplants and it's all under the name of charity be charitable then give your organs it's called suicide if you admit to that and if you have relatives he told us don't ex don't allow them to do the apnea test and don't allow them to um, to not resuscitate because that means no tr treatment whatsoever they will starve the patient they will not give him any drink and they will kill them to get the organs it sounds extreme, doesn't it? But just listen to his own talk, which also will be available. Look up Dr. Paul Byrne. He's 80 years old. He lost his, his profession because he was opposing this whole new wave in the Catholic hospitals. And uh, it's very serious. So this brain death will allow them, under who knows whose authority, and what rules here is money. It's a big business. And he notified the cardinals in Rome. He's notified the popes. He had a book exposing all this. Uh, I don't, don't remember the title of the book. And it was closed down, forbidden to be published by a cardinal in Rome. And these so-and-sos in Rome and the United States government, they all know. They don't want to stop. They don't want to stop. This is a huge business. And uh, he's, having, he's even had death threats, this good doctor. So uh, his, his talk that he gave to us will be out. And he also has a website, which I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know it off the top of my head. But just remember Dr. Paul Byrne. Uh, but, but the point is, while the body is, the heart is pumping, the blood is circulating, the urinary tract is functioning normal, the nerves are there, and he explained one case of a, a boy, a guy named Zach. He was in an accident, and they had brought him. The helicopter was arriving to come and take his heart. And his family distressed over this because he was young. He was a young guy and in his 20s. And the doctor said, well, he's brain dead, so he's as good as dead. So his brother took a knife, jackknife, and scraped up the bottom of his feet, and his whole leg jerked. And he scraped his fingernails underneath where it's sensitive, and he pulled his hand while he was brain dead. They were about to take his heart. And the family, of course, intervened and did everything they could to stop it. But sometimes they can't stop it. And the heart's still beating. So, uh, so this Dr. Byrne, God bless him, he's kind of like the Archbishop Lefebvre of, of the medical world. 
and they want him silenced. They, they want to shut him down. So my point is, we're, we're in an insane age, an apostate age that glorifies death, that has invented every possible way to stop children, has invented every possible way for, to live pleasurable and fun without God, without Christ the King. And uh, the one of the suicide rates are so high because we're not made for material pleasure and fleshly pleasure and drunkenness and, and uh, bah Bahamas 24-7. We're not made for that. We can enjoy these things and God gives legitimate things to enjoy, but we're made for Him. And we've got to fight for Him in an age that is totally betraying Almighty God and our Lord Jesus Christ and his Roman Catholic Church of Tradition. You few, stand up and keep the fight, keep the faith, and hand it down to your children, and talk to your priests, because the priests, they shouldn't be going along with this betrayal from the top. They shouldn't be silent when they know the wolves are attacking. It's a total betrayal. And some priests have told me, well, I won't do anything till I'm asked to say the new Mass. Well, that's like saying, I'm not going to jump out of the ship till it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. It's crazy. And a priest has a duty to protect the flock and bishops. And as Father Chazal says and Father Pfeiffer, if the shepherds don't shout out, then the next line of defense are the dogs. That's the priests. The shepherds are the bishops. The priests are the dogs. they got to bark. And at least bark. And if they get expelled for it, silenced, well, don't be silent when it comes to truth. Uh, and if they get uh, mistreated for that, well, big deal. What else is new? But at least you, faithful, hold strong and uh, see. You, I don't need to convince you. We're, we're in the last times, or the dress rehearsal for the last times, and you, we must be faithful. You must be warriors. You have no choice. And your crown in heaven will be really great because the saints in heaven envy our times because you're either for him or against him it's becoming more and more clear so battle on dear faithful and uh, read study pray pray the rosary humble prayer every day before God and stay close to the mother of God the Virgin Mary she's going to she's going to uncover her beautiful little feet <laughs> And the devil, as powerful as he thinks he is, and as he is now, her beautiful, white, tender feet of this humble, glorious diamond of, the, of Almighty God, the Virgin Mary, she will crush his head by the power of God. God wants to humble this proud giant under the beautiful five toes of Our Lady. She, he lies in wait for her heel. So her victory will come. But when... We don't know when. We don't know when. When the Pope consecrates Russia, but it doesn't look like this one will. So we got to fight on. And God wants that of you now. He doesn't want you to be in the victory time. He doesn't want you right now on the victory parade. He wants you in the trenches fighting, battling. And congratulations to all of you who are, and may more join your ranks. Because this is about the faith that the fight of all the line of the traditional Catholics since the Apostles. The same old battle, we defend Christ as God and King, and He alone has rights. And His laws need to permeate the political, the social, the economic, medical field. Everything must be subject to the sweet heart of Jesus, who wants only the good of all, of all those He died for. O Mary, conceived without sin, O Mary, conceived without sin, O Mary, conceived without sin, O the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. <coughs> Patrem omnipotentem, Spartorum cere terre, <coughs> visibilium omnibus invisibilium, et in unum dominum Jesum Christum filium Dionigenitum, 
Per il Padre e l'Atmante Omnia Secula, Deum de Deo, Lumen de Lumine, Deum Verum de Deo Vero. Genitum non patum consubstantialum patri, per quam omnia fatta sum, qui prote nos homines, e prote nostrum salutem de scemmi de cieli. Ed incarnatus est de Spiritu Santo, ex Maria Virgine, Grazie a tutti.